Hello, poisoners and parcel tongues. My name is TB Skyne, and this is the very first Patreon request video. Joe Guida pledged at the I would never actually expect anyone to do this highest level of my Patreon, and thus he gets to request a video topic all for himself this month. And his request was pretty simple. What's the deal with Cassiopeia? And as we shall see, the deal with her turns out to be quite a bit of stuff, actually. Now, as always, we're gonna begin with her lore, taking a look at what exactly the underlying concept for the character is, and then we'll move on to the character design, talking a little bit about how she manages to achieve, or, as the case may be, not achieve the things that she sets out to do. Now, Cassiopeia is an old champion. In fact, she dates all the way back to December of 2010. And generally speaking, when we talk about old champions on what's the deal, the deal turns out to be that they have, like, some lore before the 2014 lore retcon, but not a lot, and then after the 2014 lore retcon, they have absolutely bugger all. And so it goes with Cassiopeia. She's among the lucky ones to have a lore update that integrates her pretty smoothly into the modern state of League of Legends, but as far as lore development goes with the character, there's been practically nothing since her revised and updated bio and short story were revealed. So, in her original first state of lore, Cassiopeia, as she is indeed today, is Katarina's sister. They are both the daughters of General Ducouteau, who is a powerful general in Noxus, but where Katarina is a fighting soldier assassin running around out in the field killing people, Cassiopeia turns her hand to other things. Specifically, she turns her hand to diplomacy and seduction. So, she's hanging out all around the courts of Noxus, being like, Hey, I'm super pretty and I have breasts, you should tell me military secrets. And people, of course, do, because this is a tactic that has been used for as long as we have had warfare in the world, and it has always been effective. I do have to wonder about the pillow talk, though. It's like, oh yeah, it was great, baby, you rocked my world. Now please tell me about the troop deployments on the Eastern Front. Like, how do you slip that in? I mean, I probably wouldn't make a very good spy. Anyway, it can, of course, continue this way because she has to turn into a snake lady at some point. So, she eventually seduces a dude from the Freljord, a diplomat, and she's like, Hey, I'm super pretty and I have breasts and I'm into you. You should tell me military secrets. And he's like, Yeah, okay, I'll tell you some military secrets, but first you must swear to me on the hilt of this snake-shaped blade that you will never tell my military secrets to anyone else. And Cassiopeia's like, snake-shaped blade that some foreign tribes person makes me swear on that couldn't possibly go wrong in a world that has magic. So she swears on the blade and then she goes to her father and is like, hey daddy, guess who I just had sex with? He told me all kinds of fun stuff, which her father apparently is okay with. Anyway, once she reveals the military secrets, there's a curse. Of course there's a curse. You swore on the hilt of a handle, like, uh, on a blade that's like snake shaped. What did you think was gonna happen? Anyway, she turns into an absolutely horrifying snake. As it says in the bio, as she divulged this intelligence, a wave of revulsion washed over her. She screamed in agony as her silky skin hardened to scales, her lustrous hair thickened to leather, and her manicured fingernails sharpened to claws. When it was over, the blood-soaked figure was no longer the ravishing jewel of the Noxian court, but a horror trapped somewhere between a woman and a serpent. We'll get back to that. Anyway, because she decides that people don't want to bang snake ladies, she can't continue to be a diplomat for Noxus, which shows a profound lack of understanding of the depths of human depravity. But anyway, she decides to enter the League of Legends in order to serve Noxus as a champion on the fields of justice. This is all pre-2014 lore retcon. Then the 2014 lore retcon hits, the League of Legends itself is retconned out of existence, and Cassiopeia now needs a new reason to exist. Which presents a wonderful opportunity to integrate her into the modern lore, which Riot takes advantage of. It was always kind of an awkward fit that some dude from the Freljord happens to have a magical artifact that turns people into snakes, because like, snakes and the frozen north aren't really things that naturally go together. So, in her updated state of lore, she is tied in with the events in Shirima, the reawakening of the Shirima Empire, a seer's ascendance to the emperor that he was always meant to be, etc., etc. Cassiopeia's role goes a little bit something like this. Most things are as they were in the old lore. Cassiopeia and Katarina are still sisters, they're still the daughters of General Du Couteau, and Katarina is still like a frontline soldier running around, throwing knives around, doing whatever the hell assassins do, and Cassiopeia is more about the underhanded stuff, the diplomacy, and all the under-the-table dealings that happen behind the scenes in Noxus. 
The story makes a distinction that Katarina is trained by her father, the General du Couteau, who is a general in the Noxian army, and that's why she's the assassin fighter soldier lady out on the front lines, but uh, Cassiopeia is trained by her mother. Her mother, who's much more of a diplomat, and who's also aligned with the Black Rose. Now, we haven't spoken much about the Black Rose on this channel yet. So basically, the Black Rose is the organization that LeBlanc is leading, and their whole thing is that they do all the manipulative secret dealing and the secret dark forbidden magics and all the under-the-table, underhanded, dark, terrifying spy stuff and all the, you know, back-channel diplomacy and all the, the, the shady backstage stuff that happens in Noxus. That kind of happens at the behest of the Black Rose, who are not out in the open. They're like a secret Illuminati organization in the background. And they're generally conceptualized as a kind of competing other to the military powers of Noxus, which is why Swain and LeBlanc have a sort of flirty, a little bit intimate, but also kind of they're still political enemies looking to stab each other in the back, but they also kind of want a bone kind of relationship thing going on. Anyway, huge political game going on between the Black Rose and the military factions of Noxus. Turns out Cassiopeia's mother is in the Black Rose, but her father doesn't know that. One day, Cassiopeia's mother is almost murdered with some poison in her hairbrush, which is a novel way to kill someone. Anyway, she almost dies, and because she was almost assassinated, Cassiopeia's father has the entire house just cleared and goes like, nope, nobody else is allowed in the house, only us, because then assassins can't get in. And that's great for Cassiopeia's mother because it gives her more peace and quiet to do Black Rose stuff behind the scenes. And because Cassiopeia is kind of attached to her mother with a very strong bond, she picks up on all the Black Rose stuff and the subtle diplomacy and all those things and eventually becomes inducted as a member in the Black Rose herself. From there, the story is otherwise familiar for a while. She does all the high society, I have breasts, tell me military circuit kind of thing, and also does some assassinations and stuff like that. But then eventually, Swain overthrows Grand General Borum Darkwell, the previous military leader of Noxus who was aligned with the Black Rose. Now, Swain is there, and he doesn't really like that the Black Rose is controlling Noxus. He's not super fond of that, so he's begun this massive political war with the Black Rose. Cassiopeia's mother is like, well, shit, that's bad. You know what we need? We need some kind of ancient secret magic super weapon that we can probably find in Shirima. Conveniently, they have already been digging in Shirima, and Cassiopeia, wouldn't you know it, have been overseeing those operations with the help of a local mercenary named Siver. So Cassiopeia is like, I'm gonna go into the tombs of the ancient god creatures who used to rule this kingdom and steal their secrets. This couldn't possibly go wrong. Come on, Siver. They go into the tombs. Cassiopeia attempts to betray Siver, but she's bitten by some ancient magical idol guardian thing that is in the tomb, and that is what transforms her into the half-snake. Reading once again from the story, overcome by its arcane toxins, she was carried back through the desert by her hired soldiers, screaming as her body twisted into something new and unspeakable. Cassiopeia locked herself in the disused crypt of the Urseris residence and endured the untold agonies of this transformation. Gone was the brilliant and beautiful daughter of Sereniana do Couto, replaced with a monstrous, slithering creature that skulked in the shadows, spitting poison and crushing stone as easily as glass. And then eventually she kind of gets over that and is like, well, I've been turning into a snake, but it turns out I also have incredible magical superpowers that make me super powerful, so maybe this could be useful to the Black Rose. I mean, just outside chance they need someone to kill someone at some point. So... Let's have a look at the actual character design. Now, I will remind you that it has been part of Cassiopeia's lore from day one that she is a horrifying, terrifying, disgusting, overwhelming monstrosity. Just this horrible monster, the twisted shapes of women and snakes all tangled into each other in ways that would make you scream and vomit and piss yourself at the same time. Ah! So what does she actually look like? Well, she... She, she, she's, she's a hot lady with a snake tail. Yeah. So as you can probably tell, I consider Cassiopeia's character design a little bit of a lost opportunity to maybe do something more interesting than just 
hot lady in impressive snake cosplay. But besides just not being a very interesting execution of the concept that they're laying out, there's also a little bit of a thematic problem because Cassiopeia's whole deal is that she's this overconfident, cocky, hubris-filled character. It's like, I'm so beautiful, I'm so pretty, I have breasts, I can get military secrets out of everyone. Everyone does exactly what I say. I can manipulate everything to my own ends. And that's her hubris. And then she's punished with Nemesis, which is being transformed into a horrifying, ugly monstrosity that could never possibly manipulate anyone into doing anything with their words alone. But she's still beautiful. It's just, She has a snake tail now and some long teeth, but she's still a beautiful hot lady. And it's not like a death blow to the character because, yeah, she still, she still has a snake tail and snake teeth, I guess. So it's, yeah, she's still scary and stuff and she can't be a diplomat for Noxus anymore. Except, can't she though? Like, is, is being a hot lady with some snake bits really a deal breaker in the League of Legends universe? Shirima is literally ruled by a bird. It's literally a bird, dude. They have like a crocodile and a dog just walking around there. They're just people who exist in the world. And if you go to San and you look at all like the chem barons and they're like these horrifying people who've just got machines and pipes and stuff stuck into them and mutants like she's not really that scary or unusual by the standard of the League of Legends universe. Now, to be fair, at the time when she was released, she was, relatively speaking, somewhat more unusual in the League of Legends universe, but since then, well, times have changed. And this really is the primary problem that I have with the way her character design is executed, is that there was an opportunity here to do a much more interesting snake-human hybrid and really go into the weeds of how monstrous it looks when the anatomy of two such different creatures are mixed and matched in ways that they were never supposed to be in favor of doing a relatively vanilla hot snake naga person thing. Which brings up another subject, in fact, the subject of naga and medusa. Now, in Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and, you know, the religions and mythologies that are common to the Indian subcontinent, the Naga are a race of divine, semi-divine, sort of something along those lines, deity creatures who are variously described as being uh, just like snakes that can speak and do magic stuff, or humans that have snakes on their head and on their necks, or half-snake, half-human beings. Meanwhile, over in Greek mythology, we have the Gorgons. In the sources that survive, we know of three Gorgon sisters, daughters of some primordial sea gods and siblings to a bunch of other monsters in Greek mythology. Their names, and I'm gonna mispronounce them, are Steno, Euryale, and Medusa. Now, unusually, being the daughters of gods, Steno and Euryale are both immortal. They cannot be killed, but Medusa is mortal, and she is in fact slain by the hero Perseus. There's never really any reason given for why this is so, at least not that I'm aware of, except in a later version of the Medusa myth that was told by the Roman poet Ovid. In this version of the myth, Medusa is originally a human woman. She's ravishingly beautiful, just beautiful beyond all belief, and she's the result of jealous aspiration of many suitors. So we have a high society lady who's using her beauty to get ahead in life, who is then eventually brought low. In this version of the myth, what happens is that Poseidon, the sea god, rapes her in the temple of Athena. Athena is not too happy about that and transforms Medusa's beautiful hair into snakes and makes her face so terrible to look upon that anyone who sees her will be turned to stone. Now, if you're wondering why when it's Poseidon who's doing the rape thing, it's Medusa who gets punished for it, well, it's not like we don't have examples in the modern day of women being blamed and punished for their own sexual assault. So, yeah. Anyway, tying this back to Cassiopeia, from Greek myth, we have the whole anyone who looks upon you will be turned to stone, and we have the, although very unpleasant in origin, idea of the high society beautiful woman who's brought low by supernatural transformation. 
From Hinduist and Buddhist and Jainist myth, then, we have the visual idea of the half-snake, half-human person. Because here's the thing. In Greek mythology, none of the Gorgons, whether Medusa or her sisters, are ever described as having a half-snake body. They're described as having snakes for hair and occasionally wings with which they can fly, but they're never described as half snakes. So in modern depictions of Medusa, which often depict her at the same time as Naga, we have a mixing of two temporally and geographically extremely separate mythologies into one thing unified by snake imagery. Now, here comes the really interesting part, because Cassiopeia's updated biography ends on a note of sorta of kind of empowerment, like she's lost her beauty and her looks and all that stuff, and now she's a terrifying snake monster, at least theoretically, and that kind of depresses her because she can no longer be a diplomat and a socialite and stuff like that, but she goes, hey, I have superpowers now, maybe I can be useful to the Black Rose that way, my power is growing and it feels pretty good, actually. This is continued upon in the short story, the Shedding of Skin, which I won't go into all of the details, basically details Cassiopeia stalking, hunting, and killing by turning into stone a vicious murderer who's been stalking through the streets of Noxus, and it describes in rather explicit terms the euphoria and pleasure and joy she feels in screaming her rage at the injustice of the world. Like, when she's using her ultimate and she does the scream, which is a thing that's taken from the idea of a banshee, which is an entirely separate thing to both mid Medusa and Naga, she every it says that every fiber of her being sings with ancient power. As she screamed, her fury was replaced with joy. It felt like she was floating, her potential for greatness infinite. So, rather than the whole transformation thing being only a signifier of her being broken down and, you know, punished for being so arrogant and for being too beautiful and for flirting with men like a hussy and stuff like that. Her transformation is being presented less as a punishment and more as an empowerment. Which is very interesting to me because, as it turns out, the Medusa, and indeed the Gorgon, is not solely a monster. In ancient Greek tradition, the Gorgon was a common symbol of protection and the imagery of twin intertwined snakes, which they were often depicted as having as their belts, are symbols of fertility. And partly because of that, and partly in spite of the way that Ovid tells the myth in the 20th century, the Medusa in particular, but Gorgons in general, were taken up as symbols of empowerment by early 20th century feminists. And while I'm not at all competent to speak to the totality of that particular reinterpretation, basically, she's become a symbol and a visual signifier of female rage and self-empowerment in the face of a world that does them injustices and shames them for having injustices done to them. And that does seem to dovetail just a little bit with the reinterpretation that we get of Cassiopeia past the 2014 lore retcon. I'll remind you that in the old state of the lore, Cassiopeia's story was very clearly a thing of, oh, she's a you know, seductive hussy who seduces too many men, and then she's punished for being so seductive and dishonest. Ah, ha 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 See how the hammer of Nemesis falls over this immoral and indecent woman. But then, in the new state of the lore, we see this much more rounded, nuanced idea that, no, yeah, she's not super jazzed about having lost all of her ability to be a normal part of society, but on the other hand, being a super powerful snake lady who can turn people to stone by looking at them is also pretty cool. Which leads us back to her actual character design, which is the thing that I'm actually trying to talk about here, because my main criticism of Cassiopeia, of course, is that she's supposed to be turned into a horrifying snake monster, but she's actually just a really gorgeous lady who happens to have some snake bits grafted onto her. And that's still kind of a problem for the story, but the other way of looking at it is that she didn't actually lose anything. Her transformation didn't turn her into a horrifying monster, it just made her more powerful, and that's why she's not a terrifying snake human hybrid monstrosity thing. She didn't lose anything, she didn't lose any of her beauty, because she wasn't punished, she was empowered. So what I wanted to highlight here is that, yes, my particular criticism of the character is that she should be a horrifying, disgusting, ugly, snake, hybrid, monster thing going on. Like, that to me is much more visually interesting than the thing that they have gone for here. But there is a reading available where her current character design makes a lot more sense and in fact can be said to be a good bit of visual storytelling. Even if I'm still on Team Horrifying Snake Monster. <laughs> 
Which leads us on finally to a look at her animations. Cassiopeia is a very old champion and to the best of my knowledge she has never really received a substantial model update, although she has received some rather substantial texture updates since the early days. But because she's a very old champion, well, there aren't that many animations to take a look at. And you can really kind of see her age showing a little bit in some of her animations. Take a look at this, for example. This is one of her idol animations, which let's just move it up a little bit so we can see. And as you can see, there's that slithering animation thing going on, but it's really just a back and forth loop that kind of... Like, it, it starts and stops in a very janky, unnatural way, and that's kind of what's going on with a lot of her, and what, what what was going on with a lot of League of Legends champions in the early days is that you have these animation loops that are sort of smooth-ish, but they're not very complex, and they're not necessarily very smooth. You can see there's a little bit of jank going on with the way that her hands um, especially are moving, because they're not fully rigged to be uh, super well animated. And I think the animators have done the best that they can with what they've got, but you can kind of see how her, like, her motions are a little bit stiff, they're a little bit unsmooth, and especially compared to um, the, like, um, when, when you look at uh, modern animations in League of Legends, for a movement like this, there'd probably be some kind of animation smear. You saw this, for example, in the, especially in the uh, What's the Deal with Mordecai's video, that modern League of Legends champions and modern League of Legends character models will use a lot of breaking of the character model, a lot of animation smearing, a lot of rather advanced animation techniques, and then you look at something older like Cassiopeia here, and you can see that, like, none of that exaggeration is really present. You can see there's no re not really a lot of smearing of the model, not a lot of stretching and squashing going on, and the result of all of that is that you get these motions that are sort of, this is fine, this is, I believe this is her, her poison spit ability, this is kind of fine, but it could be a lot more interesting if you added a lot more power and weight behind the particular breaking of the animation model. This one too, you can kind of see the awkwardness that's kind of going on here. I think this is her Twin Fangs ability, um, her E. And you can kind of see, it's just basically, she just kind of claps her hands. It doesn't really look like she's throwing anything or that she's particularly launching a spell forward. It's more like, ba-boom, clap your hands. And here we have her ultimate. Which is like, which is the one that's the big one, right? This is when she displays the totality of her power, when she has her most powerful moment in the game. And how does it look? Well, that. Basically, she just kind, she just kind of leans forward and goes, "Bah." This looks more like she's saying "boo" to a bunch of children on Halloween, more than it looks like her unleashing eldritch power upon the world, like found in the depths of some ancient snake-themed tomb of some kind. And that's just basically, her model is old, and her character animations are quite old. You can see here her basic attack, which doesn't loop correctly in the model viewer. But it's also, it's an extremely, like... She, 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 she doesn't really do anything. It's more like, it's like oh, here. Here, ha have a cup of tea. No, I'll take the tea back. Have a cup of tea. No, you can't. Yeah, there you go. No, yes, no, yes, no. And there's like these very low impact animations that don't really tell us a lot about her personality. And that's kind of the other problem with, with the state of her, her current animation is that all of that thing about her being either an embodiment of like female rage, like I was transformed into this monster and I'm gonna make you feel the pain for that that's on display in the Shedding the Skin story, or this formally seductive like sort of high society, oh, come here, sailor, tell me some military secrets, I have breasts kind of character. None of that is really on display with her. There isn't a lot of personality personality to go around in her animations. I think the the closest we get is kind of here when she does this hip wiggling kind of thing that's sort of vaguely interesting going on. This is her dance animation where she does this kind of belly dancing thing. But the trouble with that is, do they do belly dancing in Noxus? Is that like, is that a thing? I mean, I'm completely willing to accept that belly dancing is a thing in Noxus, but it's not something that's ever really been brought up. So. And that's the other problem, by the way, with her character design that I've completely neglected to mention, is that she looks 110% Shereman at all times. Like, there's nothing about her that looks Noxian. And if she was a Shereman champion who lives in Shurima and does Shurima stuff in Shurima, that makes perfect sense that she would dress like the Shereman people, but she's a Noxian, and she hangs out in Noxus, and she does Noxus stuff in Noxus for Noxians as part of the Black Rose, and so it's a little bit weird that she's dressed in all of this, like, gold and green, 
um, and all of this, uh, you know, this uh, sort of pharaoh headgear thing going on that looks like she took it off uh, the, the coffin of some, you know, long dead Egyptian queen. Which, like, might make a bit more sense if you gave her some black and red and sort of really draped her in the colors of Noxus. That would be a thing, I guess, for a potential remake. And I'd love to talk more about, like, the specifics of her animation, but they're kind of all very basic and simple. Like, they're all competent, I'll say that. Like, I don't think the animator who, who, who created the animations for her back in the day was doing a bad job by any means. It's just they only had so many resources uh, to throw around and none of them were like it's you can only do so much when you have that I do like her taunt animation though because that's the the only moment really with her character where you really see the sort of the idea of the seductress thing coming out with her kind of snaking her way forward and then rearing up in what looks to me to be some kind of an attack pose basically Someone comes too close, she whips them with her tail and stands up. But again, you can kind of also see how it's a little bit like it's the the crawling bit is less seductive and more like water, water. I'm so thirsty. Oh, hello, hi. I'm I'm totally fine actually. Hi, do you have some water? Please come here. Oh my God, that's tap water. I wanted Lacroix. <laughs> uh, it's it's like it, it lacks that that flair that modern League of Legends animation has. So, in summary, Cassiopeia is an old champion who doesn't have a lot of lore, but the lore she has has some surprisingly interesting connections with the mythology that inspired her character design. And while my primary complaint with her is that she's yet another hot girl with her tits out in League of Legends, which is kind of boring, especially in comparison to the horrifying human snake hybrid mutant monster that I'm promised in her lore, you can also construct different readings of her character design based on the real life history and mythological and cultural contexts of the monsters that inspired her. And thank you very much for watching another episode of What's the Deal. I put a little bit of extra effort into this one because, well, it was directly paid for by someone on Patreon, and I like to go the extra mile for them. So if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to hit the like button, the comment button, subscribe button, and all the other buttons that make the YouTube numbers go up so my channel gets to stay alive. And if you would like to request your own episode of something, any topic you want on my channel, then you can head on over to Patreon and sign up for the highest tier of support that I never expected anyone to sign up for, and you too can have a video for yourself, just like this one on any topic that you want. Or you can sign up for like a $1 subscription a month to help the channel. That's also an option, and I appreciate you equally much. I just don't necessarily make videos specifically on, uh, you know, request. If you don't want to sign up for a monthly subscription, I get it completely. There's also tip jars down in the description that you can use to give me like a one-time tip to say, hey, good job making the video about the thing that I watched. That was, that was nice of you. And as I say at the end of my videos, even $1 to an online content creator can be the same as thousands of views on a video. So whether it's me or it's someone else, if there are online content creators whose work you enjoy, please consider supporting them directly with whatever you can, because even those very small amounts that feel like they don't matter that much, matter a lot more than you think to us. Of course, if you can't afford to give any direct support like that, that's completely okay. It's enough that you have watched the video this far. If you haven't enjoyed the video, well, that is a pity, isn't it? I would like to apologize to you for the lacking quality of this video by presenting you with the dislike button right down below. Merely place your cursor upon the dislike button to register your displeasure. Yes. Press the button. Seal the pact. Unleash the dark power. Uh, thank you very much for watching. 